My name is Glenn Luther. I'm a professor here at the College of Law and I have the honor of introducing you to the Halleck Chair in Advocacy and to our very special guest, Judge Jerry Morin. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome you to the College of Law this afternoon and as we gather today we acknowledge that we are on Treaty 6 territory in the traditional homeland of the Métis. Pay our respect to the First Nation and Métis ancestors of this place and reaffirm our relationship with one another. We're delighted that so many of you could join us for this special lecture this afternoon and we thank you for your attendance. I'd particularly like to acknowledge uh, members of the province's judiciary who I will not name because I'm sure I'll miss uh, several because they are definitely here in numbers. Uh, I also noticed uh, uh, Senator Lillian Dick who I want to acknowledge is, is present as well and I'm sure there's others I've missed but welcome. The lecture is delivered in conjunction with the Silas E. Halleck QC Visiting Scholar and Advocacy position which was cr created at the College of Law in the fall of 2009. The position and related lecture were made possible by a generous gift from our friend Silas Halleck and a supplementary gift from his friends and admirers. Silas Halleck QC, who is sitting here in the front row, or in the second row in, in the red sweater, we're so very pleased to see you today. Uh, Cy, um, Cy graduated from the College of Law with an LLB in 1961, and he certainly is one of Saskatchewan's most distinguished advocates. He's a leading lecturer in Federation of Law Society criminal law conferences throughout the 80s and 90s, which is a national program. He's represented many prominent clients and has served as counsel in a number of public inquiries throughout the country. The Silas E. Halleck Visiting Scholar and Advocacy is actually a two-day or three-day program uh, where Judge Morin will be uh, encouraged to interact with our students in terms of the mooting program. He's visiting my law and psychiatry class tomorrow to talk about his court. Uh, I know he's also visiting uh, at our Poverty Law cl uh, cl uh, Clinic Classic uh, on Wednesday. So he's actually giving us three days of his time uh, to interact with students. Uh, today, uh, clearly we want to uh, bestow this honour on a very distinguished uh, advocates and certainly uh, Judge Jared, Gerald Morin um, fits that bill. Judge Morin was born and raised in Cumberland House in northern Saskatchewan and is a member of the Peter Ballantyne Cree Nation. Also wanted to acknowledge his family, many members of which are here near the front of the room. He started his justice career, he tells me, at age 19 as a probation officer for the province of Saskatchewan in 1973. He then enrolled in, in a Bachelor of Social Work at the University of Regina where he studied from 1979, 75 to 79. He then moved to Winnipeg where he became an assistant professor at the University of Manitoba School of Social Work where he worked from 1981 to 1984. And during that time he was uh, tasked with developing a trading program for people to develop an on-reserve on child and family services programs. He was looking for a new challenge thereafter. In the mid-1980s, Judge Moran decided to pursue a law degree and he joined the U of S College of Law in 1984. After graduating um, from the college in 1987, he began practicing law in Prince Albert with the Mandia Moran uh, Law Office. And during this time, he was appointed or appeared at all levels of the court, including the Supreme Court of Canada. In 2001, Judge Moran was appointed to the Provincial Court of Saskatchewan and is pioneering uh, of a court that provided services in Cree in Northern Saskatchewan, saw the introduction of that language into the courtroom and to the justice system. He has generously supported the College of Law and our students, including establishing the Wanasway Lecture in Aboriginal Law, which has enabled the college to invite distinguished lectures in the area of Aboriginal Law to speak to the university. Um, without further ado, please join me in welcoming the Honourable Judge Gerald Moran. Nadaskumono de Betutian, the Bewichirian Uda, you want Nanaskumono Mota, the ski, the Bendoaba, the Manago, the Pig Squat the gig. I am indeed honored to be here today, and I certainly want to acknowledge not only my family who's here to support me, friends, and Mr. Sai Halleck. I want to say a few things with respect to Mr. Sai Halleck, because I think it's important. I remember when I started my career a few years ago and I was looking to see where and who I could get some advice from and although I could always look and count on different friends like 
Don Worm, he was just starting out himself, so I could limit my discussions in many ways. I needed somebody that had some depth and knowledge in relation to the practice of law. And I remember hearing about Cy Halleck. And so I talked to him, and he graciously agreed that I could certainly deal with him on major issues that I felt I needed to talk to him on ethics, on the practice of law. And he's always been a good friend. We've done some cases together, the Nurland Inquiry, which was a major inquiry a number of years ago. We did uh, a murder case together, which I learned lots. So I thank you and I, that you have given me the honor to say a few words today. And it's important that I think it's the students here that are very, very important. And to them, I want to acknowledge three students that I invited today because I think sometimes it's important that we acknowledge each other and that what work we might have done, we do in some ways look to others. And not only the young students that are here, and I know I invited um, Lisa Morin, I invited uh, Robin Ermine, and Ram Worm, who's here today, and because I think they will be carrying the torch in many ways. And things I talk about today, perhaps in the future, will become a reality for them in how they deal with things. And to the rest of you, I say to you, keep an open mind in what I'm talking about. I say that in all respect, because what I'm going to talk about is justice through the indigenous perspective. And so if I deal with things that are historic in nature, I bring them to the forefront because what has happened in the past is relevant to the future. We have learned from the past and hopefully we don't repeat many, many things that have occurred. But they're very significant and they're still relevant today. If we go back just slightly and not to spend a lot of time, but I think it's important to set the stage. At the time of making treaty between the two parties, it worked on the basis of what we call Wagutwin, with the Skewin, and Pastawin. Those are the three concepts I will talk about today. Wagutwin is a word that looks at and not to be understood on just merely the basis of its translation of relations, relationships. It is one that carries on. It is one that is not only your immediate family, your community, your surroundings, but also with the non-indigenous population. As it says in Delgamuk, and as many people have said, we are all in this together. And together, we certainly need to work towards solutions of what is facing us in terms of justice. In treaty, it said, among other things, when they were talking about responsibilities, it said, they promise and engage that they will in all respects obey and abide by the law, and they will maintain peace and good order between each other, and also between themselves and other tribes of Indians, and between themselves and others in Her Majesty's subjects, whether Indians or whites. It also stipulates they will aid and assist the officers of Her Majesty in bringing to justice and punishment any Indian offending against the stipulations of this treaty or infringing the laws in force in the country. Perhaps maybe that is why they're starting to look at funding the additional resources for indigenous policing. But let's go back a bit 
because, of course, to look at Saskatchewan and the history, we have to understand that it has its basis elsewhere. So when I look at it, I go beyond a little 1905. I go to the 1870s, just briefly. But it is when, of course, that things occurred. Significant things occurred around that period of time. In 1880s, residential schools started. But let me step ahead a bit. During the time of treaty, and around that period of time, of course, Real Rebellion was going on, treaty people were starting to feel uncomfortable that maybe the deal they made with their partner was not quite working out the way they wanted it to be. So they were starting to question. They were starting to appear at the fort and asking, where are the things that they have been promised? This was seen to be a bit of a threat in some ways. And with the Real Rebellion, sometimes you say that the first victim in that situation, as in any war, is the truth. The federal government started looking at this leadership and perhaps saying that they were traitors and that they should not be trusted. And as such, they were found to be, and they charged approximately 50 people. 28 people were convicted. But this is significant. The hanging of eight Indian leaders in November of 1885 in front of the students from the North Battleford Industrial School was a very significant event. They did it on the grounds of that residential school and they hung eight people. That's a powerful message to give to people. It sets the stage for what may be coming in the future. Around that same period of time, the past system is introduced which had no legal basis for its existence. But it was used for about 60 years plus. You can ask yourself, well, what's the significance of that now? Well, let me tell you a little story of the past system. In 1946, it was still in play. My own parents, who lived on a reserve, needed the permission of the Indian agent to take their child who was sick to the hospital in Nepal, some distance away, approximately 90 kilometers, which they would have had to travel overland. They asked the Indian agent. The Indian agent said, no, my brother died. My parents were obviously very upset. My father, enfranchised because part of the Indian Act allowed for assimilation in that sense and enfranchisement. How does that affect me now? It doesn't affect me so much but it certainly affects my son because when my dad got his treaty rights back in 1985 it created a 6-1 because he had married a 6-3 I became a 6-2. I married a 6-3 I cannot pass on status. It's very significant when your nationhood is affected by those type of matters. It is still real. My son is still affected by that. I've always said him and I could go hunting and he could be charged for hunting with a treaty Indian. <clears throat> the one I go hunting with is Judge Dufour. I'd love to see him charged. <clears throat> because I'd like to see where it would go. But that past system was long-standing. The removal of children started in the 1870s and lasted until 1996. TRC, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, said government quit counting at 4,000 students that have died and they estimated somewhere in 
about 6,000 had died during the lifespan of that. The next thing that occurred was they outlawed religious freedom. That affected that, for instance, it was in the Indian Act that no Indian would be allowed to go in their regalia to go dancing outside the reserve or to practice in the West Coast was the potlatch, which affected not only religious factors, but economic factors. There was, a, as I stated, explicit assimilation policies. Enfranchisement was pushed hard. When my father said he was going to enfranchise, they were only too happy to accommodate him. Gave him his hundred dollars and away he went. But what it did also, it really affected the woman's position in our First Nations. Because when, a when a, an Indian woman married a white man, they lost her status. That was significant. And only lately, these things are starting to get resolved. Now, when they passed on an acquired land, I remember looking at this in 1993 when we started looking at treaty land entitlement. When they looked at the total settlement of lands from the treaty making process, it only amounted to 1.5% of the total land holding in Saskatchewan. That's the extent of the treaty base. That's the extent of the reserves in Saskatchewan. That's not very much. But yet, there was a systemic fraud and widespread land speculation, which was documented in the Ferguson Report and the loss of good agricultural land severely eroded any means of economic development and employment. When that report came out in 1915, there was never any criminal charges from that. Albeit, people will say there were other things going on that were quite important. First World War, for instance. That was going on. So that was significant. In the 20s, the Indian Act Amendment prevented Indian bands from hiring lawyers to pursue their legitimate claims. It was against the law for First Nations to hire lawyers. And the reason for that, it, stimula it was stimulated from occurrences on the West Coast when the Nishka were pushing their land claim and the federal government took the opportunity to change the law so that lawyers could not be hired by Indian bands to pursue their claims. This stayed in the books till the 50s and the amendments. So that's certainly a major way to control people. You take their children, you change the laws with respect to how they can move, you change the laws with respect to how they can lose their status, you prevent them from hiring lawyers. Why would you need to bring, build jails if that is how you're keeping people down? Now, after the no lawyer amendment, something else occurred. The Natural Resources Transfer Agreement Act, which allowed for the transfer of resources to be passed on to the province, became a province in 1905, 1930. They were lobbying the federal government. They wanted control of their resources. Now, they had no input from the other signee of the treaty. If that was a two party process, they very significantly ignored one part of the treaty making process, one of the partners, and made laws that are still very much active today. We've heard in the last while, for instance, the last two, three years, questions have been posed to the Premier 
Are you going to look at revenue sharing? That's where it stems from. The answer has been no. They do not feel they have an obligation to do that. The elders have always, always stated this is considered unfinished business. The rest of Saskatchewan residents benefit from the revenue generated from all mining, oil, and gas revenues, and none of it goes to any First Nation. How do you reconcile that? But when you make the rules, and you enforce the rules, and you don't allow the other party to have any legal help, perhaps you do it in that fashion. Soon after the First World War, another thing occurred. The Soldier Settlement Act did not allow for treaty Indian soldiers who volunteered in both World War I and II and Korean Wars to get any lands. It allowed for the soldiers, the veterans of everybody else to acquire 160 acres per person. The Indian veterans and many Métis veterans did not get that land transfer. Again, a significant way to undermine possible economic development for people. <clears throat> and then, of course, we see the 60s scoop and saw thousands of indigenous children taken from their homes by child welfare and placed in non-indigenous homes across Canada, UK, and the USA. It is still going on. And I will point out something that occurred, that has happened to me in the last while, within the last three weeks. Back in 19... 69, a young cousin of mine was apprehended from his family because he was experiencing major allergy problems and a heart murmur. We never saw him after that. I just received a note from another relative who said, I won't name the other person, but so-and-so wants to meet us. He's our cousin. He's 49 years old. I'm thinking he probably has a family. I don't know that yet. But that's part of what occurred. I saw many friends being taken away from their homes. I lost friends. I remember being in the Court of Appeal a number of years ago and seeing an old friend of mine being brought in in shackles, and I was there ready to argue another case. I sat there and looked. They started describing how terrible this guy was and that they needed to increase his sentence to a year instead of the six months that he had received. I was sort of dumbfounded because that's not, we nicknamed him back then Ducky. His name was Doug. We call him Ducky. That's not how I knew Duck. I feel years and time goes by. Always regretted I never stood up and said anything, but I was so dumbfounded what was going on in front of me. But he, they never saw him when he walked around couch surfing, surfing, trying to find a place to stay and crying for his siblings. They didn't see him suffer in that way. So I saw somebody different. So when we say where are we going and how did the rest of society at that time develop? When I look back and looked at the research that has been done by a couple of the students, I don't know if they're here today, Jaina and Miss Nixon, are they around? They might not be. They probably got tired reviewing all this material that they had researched. 
But it, it is important to note that when Saskatchewan became a province, they of course inherited some of the things that were going on in, in Northwest Territories. They started building jails. But I'll tell you this right from the start. From 1905 to basically 1950, there was very, very few Indians in the criminal justice system. It was mostly people that were displaced by the dirty 30s, the people that were moving in, and at that time, they had major laws with respect to alcohol. Many young men that I've grown up with over time, alcohol was a bit of a factor in their life, and I'm sure it was back then too. But most of those ended up in jail. And they also targeted religious groups. The Dukabors were targeted to a certain extent when they would not register their lands because they failed to see why they should. Jehovah Witnesses were also targeted in certain ways. And poor people who were jumping the trains going from point A to point B, they ended up in a lot of those jails. I found that interesting. The other thing I found interesting during that period of time is that we looked at the development of jails to be one of a self-sustaining institution. In other words, you'll find many of the, uh, of the annual reports dealing with the issue of we had 1,548 pounds of pork sold and we made $1,033 as a profit. We had 1,600 bushels of barley. I wondered what they could have done with that barley in those facilities, but <clears throat> they would focus on what they made, and they would say, by the way, we had 13 prisoners, but they would not extract of what ethnic origin. Now, in 1940s, there was a change in how to look at, prior to that, it was straight warehousing, profit making. There was a change around that period of time. T.C. Douglas, who's been known for many other reforming things, he also looked at reforming the criminal justice system and how it might operate. He made significant changes through the Penal Commission. And they looked at introducing a more humane way of dealing with prisoners and trying to look at rehabilitation, providing training. And in the latter years, towards the 50s, they even looked at work camps up north so that people could get some training, meaningful training, and maybe make some money. That carried on into the 60s. But again, not a very high number of Indian people in those facilities. Now, we come to the 60s. I don't know who's trying to phone me, but I should have shut it off. The in the 60s, of course, we finally get to vote. We get a, the right to vote. We never had that right to vote till the 1960s. Now, one might think, could I get you to deal with the volume of what you think? I'll shut it off. <clears throat> In the 60s, when we got the right to vote, it also allowed 
for more movement. Now, of course, I'm not spending a lot of time with other things that were going on. There was a lot of organizing that was going on with FSIN and the predecessors to our governments in relation to that. With the rest of the people, you've got to remember that most of them have been a number of generations in the residential school process. They had gone home, and a lot of them rejected their own parents. They rejected them because that's what they were taught. I know that from personal experience. In my extended family, <clears throat> there was one uncle who died saying that he was not raised by his own parents. He had rejected his parents. When I did the eulogy, it struck me that my grandparents were not even mentioned in the information. I filled in the parts, of course, because I knew the history. But that's how significant that type of brainwashing was. I'm talking only in the last five years in terms of that problem between older siblings who could not reconcile their differences as to how one was affected and how one related to the other. So those type of situations are very significant. Now in the 60s, I'll say this one little side thing. In the 60s, when Indians got the vote, my wife's family, their family farm, was the polling booth for the Yellow Quill First Nation, just right next door to the Yellow Quill. My wife's family remembers when they had the polling station at their house. So they've had a long relationship with Indians, thank goodness. <clears throat> now, again back to the 60s. We start seeing major impacts of the interaction. Now not only are you received the systematic systemic racism government action, you are now meeting individuals out on the street. You are now being judged by people you meet down the street. How significant or how relevant is that? I remember when Scar Rapids Dam was being built in 1960-61, my dad worked there. And because the river was all muddied up, we did had no other place to get water. But in the white enclave that was right next door, we lived in shack tents. The non-indigenous people lived in houses. And we could get water there, but at 7 o'clock, a chain link fence came up. And we could not cross that line. It was right there. You do not cross. You're not welcome here after such and such a time. When I was a probation officer, we went up to a, a northern camp. And it really struck me when we were um, interacting with the, uh, some of the guides there. And then all of a sudden, I heard this clang, 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 and they all disappeared, and I wondered what happened. And I, just, so I asked, and they said, no, we, ha we have to be away from these areas at this time. It really upset me. It really triggered a memory of ostracization and separation and I demanded that we leave the next day because this was not a place I wanted to be at if we're going to deal with probation matters 
And I was out of there the next day. I did not want to be there. It was not a friendly place. They marginalized their own guides and they marginalized their help. And that struck me. Other forms of racism that I have faced over the years, many, many, many. The number of times and the different names I've acquired over the years, and there were times I would get equally sarcastic to people. When you're called chief, I'd say, you know, I don't exactly refer to you as prime minister. So why the hell are you addressing me as chief? I've never been elected as one. I don't deserve that honor, but you're using it in negative fashion. It was constant. But certainly, you, got, you get friends and you, you're fine with different names you call each other, but that's between friends. But when you're dealing with a stranger and somebody judges you by the color of your skin, that's a different matter. I remember walking down in Calgary and we had been over to my sister-in-law's place and I was just going for a walk and I saw this vehicle parked there and I smiled and all I saw was a scared face and the older lady was sitting there not a care in the world looking elsewhere but this scared face and I could see her reaching over now all I heard was click I figured I'm not exactly going to go bother you, but I smiled and walked on. But the message was clear. She was scared of me. Why? I don't know. I'm an ugly guy, I realize that. <clears throat> but there are many, many instances of racism that I had to deal with. Hiring my blonde-haired friend to go with my blonde-haired wife to go find a place because I just got turned down from the same place. Somehow, it was available. On and on. So, what else was going on? In the 60s and right after, you saw significant numbers jump up. Now you are starting to see the implications of meeting our neighbors and what that means. The numbers within the correctional centers jumped up with where we were six or seven percent of the population jumped up to 48 percent within the jails. Those are very significant numbers. It continually rise to 70 percent where we are 10% of the population. To even now, when you look at the figures now, and you say, okay, the biggest numbers recently say we have jumped somewhere 104%, and it's remands that are the highest. And I'm starting to think, how do we interpret those numbers? Well, one way I looked at them, when I looked at the numbers and the, the raw data, I said, maybe we're starting to see where the accumulation of the criminal records of many people is starting to come up within what we look at in bail hearings under Section 5 to 15 and the record and the likelihood that one might commit a crime and maybe that is what is being looked at and the high incidence of violence. I don't know, but those are significant numbers. Now, the changes within the correctional system, within the justice system, also looked at a movement into the community, away from the warehousing process. Probation was major, community training residences, the training, conditional sentence orders, and then all of a sudden, 
there's a major reaction, there's a major shift that perhaps we need to limit those. And that happened in the last number of years that maybe we should not be moving so much into the community and we have to restrict and we have to go back to warehousing of people. You see that shift going on. It's significant. The other thing that I found significant was a number of dangerous offender applications of indigenous people. We are the highest in Canada of dangerous offender applications. So what is it that we need to do? What changes do we need to make to maybe affect real change? One of the things in dangerous offender applications is that the province, for instance, have a dedicated person whose job it is to look and flag people who have significant records. So they know who they're looking at. And once that person is charged, the communication start. When the Section 753 application is made, and a person is charged of a major offense to which he might receive a sentence of more than two years, communication start to that prosecutor saying if he gets convicted then a dangerous offender application has got to be made. Now <clears throat> I'll stop there for a moment I'll go back to something. One of the things that has never really been done in the criminal justice system is that with all this going on in the past and keeping people, which I say was a form of incarceration made by laws that prevented movement of people, there was never an effort to look at the poverty issues and to do something about the poverty issues and to look at the underlying effects of what might cause criminal behavior. Nobody ever spent any time dealing with that. Sure, there's dis peripheral discussions about it. A lot of it centered into how we might relate to each other. A lot of cultural practices which are required and needed. But who has made any type of significant effort to deal with undereducation, with underemployment, never mind real employment, of the people that were now leaving the reserves. It was like you finish your sentence, now you're out, you're on your own, with real, no plan. And then you look at other numbers that are important. If you look at the ratio of policemen in the rest of the province, and you look at the cities in Regina, Saskatoon, the ratio is roughly one policeman for every 500 plus people. It's still significant. In Pelican Arrows, it's one in 193 people. That's a major amount of contact that are, can occur. It's within a confined area. You're going to find people interacting in different ways. So it's significant. So when I start asking the question of where do we go from here? How is it that we need to change? And what can we do? Remember what I said in the beginning. We are all in this together. Two parties made treaty. 
And it was based on Wagotwe, a relationship. We have to go back to the basics of how we are going to relate to each other in the future. What changes are we going to make in relation to that? Because if the 60s scoop and the residential schools, people are now starting to say, say the new residential school is jails. And if we are increasing the number of indigenous people going to jails, we got to step back. How many will it take to satisfy the notion that we are safer in our communities? Is it sheer numbers? Or is there a better way? A very, when I thought of trying to name this lecture, one of the avenues that I thought of was that maybe we would make a dangerous offender application against the government as just a catchy title. Because what they have done in relation to the past practices, they have made significant decisions that affect people in a totally negative way. I'm not being facetious to the point of making fun of it. I'm trying to make an, the analogy that what has happened it's affected people, but nobody has ever made the effort to try and change the root causes of the problem. Yes, we are maybe too busy with other things, but <clears throat> this is something that is going to affect us into the future. It's not just us, but our children's children into the future. We have that responsibility. So when I say to young people, young lawyers, non-indigenous lawyers, indigenous lawyers, the one thing I have is hope. I have always had hope. I still believe in hope. Because it is the basis of our original relationship of Wagotuin. There are two parties. And you're not going anywhere, and I'm not going anywhere. So how do we work and make significant changes? I'm not asking to look at a totally separate system to be developed. Not necessarily a parallel system of how we deal with criminal criminality. But maybe we need to look at major reform and somewhere in the future, once the capacity is there in different communities, then you might start looking at other avenues of change. But we do need to do major reform. We cannot keep waiting until the next victim is made and then make a decision that you're going to make a dangerous offender application on a person. You have a responsibility to intervene to make sure there is no other victim. Because one victim is too many. When I speak to young people in the courts, certainly the use of my language is important. Because I think, as somebody said, with a greater mind than mine, you speak to a person in a language they understand, you reach their intellect. You speak to them in their own language, you reach their heart. I practice and always have the teachings of Wagotuin. It is important, I tell them, that you have a responsibility to understand what your parents are trying to do for you. When they are trying to stop you, you have a responsibility to hear what they're saying. That they love you, and they're not saying no just because they want to be mean. They care for you. They want to make sure you're safe. 
so on and so forth. I discuss the protocols of what it means to have a partner to young men who find themselves in an abusive situation. I talk about our responsibility as men, as partners, that we were not taught to hurt our partners, not to hurt the mothers of our children. Those are the teachings that are not enunciated anywhere, but I've always been a part of not only treaty making, but also in our everyday life. So, the one concept that I did not talk about is Pastawin. I talked about it a bit in the beginning. What is that? Pastawin derives from the word to go beyond, but if you put a religious connotation to it, it's to sin. When I was dealing with elders in a number of years ago at the treaty table, I remember the, the late Gordon Oakes, place is named after him here. I learned lots from Gordon Oakes, Jimmy Mayo, Danny Masqua, Alma Ketwehat. They explained many things to me in relation to those teachings and how we must conduct ourselves with respect to respect all human beings, indigenous or non-indigenous. Love, generosity, honesty, one that I always had trouble with, humility, and maybe hopefully somewhere, wisdom. But looking at those type of things, I remember Danny Musqua, when I asked him permission to leave to become a judge, I had a, a fantastic discussion with these four people. And we discussed the issues of the difficult trail that I was going to follow. That I would be expected to do things that I might not agree with because that's what the law says. They understood that. They understood it clearly. And Danny Musqua related to it in this fashion when he said, it's like Uskape Ace, he says. And Uskape Ace, in our, in our way of looking at the world view, is when a young person starts working with an elder and he does not do the ceremonies, he does not do any of that, but he learns. He learns what is going on. He learns the meaning of different things. I think Sagage Henderson, a number of years ago, described it, you are entering into a lodge that many different things will occur. Danny Musqua said, you will find yourself making decisions that are difficult. You will find yourself having to learn what it is to be fair and to be true in relation to what needs to be done. I found those type of discussions, and over the years we've had different ones, but I thought that one was a very significant one to te tell me that in entering the area of being a judge and the responsibility and the accountability was no small effort. It was going to take a lot of who I was and that I would deal with people that I would not agree with on a lot of things, but to keep doing, hopefully to make a difference. There are people that laugh at me because I have a nap that says when I'm going to retire. I think I, somebody asked me about it today. Well, <laughs> Maria Campbell did. And I think it's got um, 178 days and counting. 
But that's not really the point. It's a journey that I'm sure I will take elsewhere. But when I say to you, what changes should we make? Let me list a couple of things. I think we're just about over time. Yeah. When I said we need to make significant changes, here's one that is really different. All the times that we have people in jail, they have changed very significantly to little or no type of training occurring in these jails for people that are in there. Very little upgrading, very little education. I say that we make major changes because if we're just going to warehouse people and then let them out, what have we done to change their life? What, have we, what hope have we given them if we're just going to let them out with no significant change in their ability to find a place in society? Why don't we provide better education processes in there? Who's to say that you can't get somebody to be looking at electrical training? Carpenter, plumbing, name it. Never limit your mind in relation to what that might be. But if we do nothing, I get back to the main point. How many will it take before we feel safe? How many do people do we need to incarcerate? What's the magic number? There is none. And we're not doing anything to make our society safer by merely warehousing and trying to remove people and making them long-term offenders. Just like we do not give up on government to make the right decision, just like we do not think that they have crossed that road of Pastawan and being made a sin in relation to what their original, original agreements were, to share the land, to be partners, not keep us on the side, marginalized. We need to be true partners. If we look at little things, just to give you an example. Mediation, for instance. Everybody says, wow, what a good way. People can reconcile and make some changes. But the policy comes around and says you can only do it once. Even baseball has three strikes and four balls. <laughs> the issue is, I look at it differently. I say, if it's something that occurs between family, between family members, wouldn't it be better if they made peace between themselves without having a court to sanction what? One will be guilty and one will serve a sentence? And there, solved. It's better they make peace between themselves in a manner that is consistent to the idea that Wagutuan works. If we look at probation services, <coughs> probation services has changed when there were more hands-on. And there used to be a program in the 70s, it was called the Indian Probation Project. They had probation officers on reserves, many, many reserves, so that the contact was immediate, that the contact was gonna be made by people on the probation, not on maybe on a two-week basis, they'll come in to the reserve, it was constant. Why can't we look at expanding those type of services so that there's somebody on there that steers people to try and get employment, to try and get the rehabilitation? Those type of situations. One of the other ones that I've often talked about is nobody really stops you from sending people to jail, but you can never sentence a person to a rehab center. And the reason for that is simple. It's not designated as a jail. Therefore, we can't not sentence anybody to a rehab center. Why don't we designate 
a number of beds onto rehab centers so that we can have a better chance that the person will because 28 days is no magic to 28 days and some of you might hear Harold Johnson talk about where that comes from it comes from insurance companies that says they'll only pay 28 days or 29 days I think it is that's where it stems from but most people will say you need three four months if I'm going to sentence somebody to four or five months, why not into a rehab center and that the programming changes? It's a designation that makes a difference. And I know people will say, what about safety? What about uh, risk factors? I've read so many reports over the years that always tell me that he was a model prisoner. If they were a model prisoner in there, why can't they be a model prisoner in a rehab center? So, when we want to make differences, when we want to make major changes, we have to ask ourselves the same question. How can we work together? How can we move forward and stop this process of putting more people in jail? In a Cree world view of things, I look at people and I deal with them, and I say, the first word that comes to mind is a sipitak. It means one who doesn't listen. You always see people that come to court, they've never listened to their parents, right, son? They've never listened to their teachers. They've never listened to their probation officers, let alone a judge. They got their own drummer. They're not going to listen to anybody. So that person you got to deal with in certain ways. Then you got the other person that comes in, and one who is poor, not in monetary sense, but does not have the skills, the life skills, he has got addictions. He is poor in how he manages life. He starts stealing. He starts getting involved in that. More drugs. So you have to deal with him in rehabilitation. Then you have the occasional person. Yogipatsit. One who makes a big mistake. He will pay for it dearly for a long, long time. He hasn't drank for a long time. He gets drunk. He runs over somebody and kills them. Society demands punishment. Not many do I find in the last category. He matzats it, the evil one. One who will do anything and everything to prey on their own, to make and hurt people. The Paul Bernardos of the world, the Olsons of the world, we should not be making laws based on the extremities of people's actions, but we have to a certain extent. We need to take a good look at how many of those truly even evil ones we have, or how many we can help along the way. I know that it takes a long time. But if we keep on this route, it's going to be equally as long. It's going to be equally as damaging. There is nothing wrong with stopping and taking a good hard look. What is the end goal of what the present system is? How much will we achieve? Don't jump onto the costs right away. Look at the human costs. That's what we need to focus on. So I say to you, to end, I suppose the time is always right to do what is right. And I appreciate your attendance today. And 
I welcome this opportunity, and thank you very much, Sai. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Judge Morin. Uh, Judge Morin has agreed. I know it's about 1.05, so some of you may need to leave. And if you do, just go ahead. We're going to take a few, few more minutes. There's a class in here at 1.30, so we'll take another 10 or 15, perhaps. Um, and Judge Morin has agreed to take any questions from the crowd that you might want to address to him. No questions? Okay, well, I think, oh, here's one. Go ahead. I think I just took off my socks and shoes and I'm looking at a glass field. <clears throat> One always has to be careful in relation to wandering into those areas. And I'm not a politician. There's a lot of politicians that probably have viewpoints with respect to it. I think I've made my point in saying that elders looked at it as unfinished business. That part of what maybe needs to occur is to revisit that and maybe that's the way that we look at making real change because it affects the econ economic development of First Nation communities without the revenue sharing. But yet the province wants to encroach onto the reserves of having their laws valid but there doesn't seem to be any reciprocal. So I think they need to take a look at it and say if there's unfinished business and it was made on dubious grounds when they didn't have lawyers and changes were made, no communication. I think there's room to, for discussion. Well, first of all, I remember back in the 70s when we started looking at probation because we even had probation hostels in the north where people paid rent and we got them jobs, we got them bank accounts, we helped them go set it up. And I remember me and this other probation officer, every morning we would get up early, go pick up one or two guys take them to work, they got paid, took them to the bank, hands-on in relation to it. Somebody calls it babysitting, no. You're trying to teach somebody something, and that's one way. Yes, it's a little more, I suppose, uh, takes you away from other things, but I've run into those young people, they're adults. I've placed people in with uh, a plumbing helper and when he started working for that person when that owner died he left him a great part of that business built himself to that what I'm talking about is that it has morphed into almost a third arm of enforcement and I say that with all due respect 
in relation to probation officers. They provide us a lot of work in terms of, of uh, pre-sense reports. They have to go talk to people. They provide that type of information. But it seems that they almost have a checklist of what they might get a probationer to do. They will follow it up by making phone calls, but they have no hands-on approach as to how that will work. When I said earlier, perhaps they should look at making sure somebody's there full time on the community so that they can follow up. Johnny's starting to have a little problem. I heard that he's drinking a bit. What can you, can you focus on that a bit? Steer him into that or make sure he pulls in that application. It's that type of situation. What is so wrong with that approach? It's practical, it's real, and it'll make a difference for some people as opposed to, did you go here, did you go there, did you do that, did you do this, how come you missed that appointment? It's a checklist. There's a breach of probation. It becomes almost another charge. And yet we try and use it for rehabilitation purposes. But I'm not sure how much of that really goes on. Yes. Judge Moore, it's um, real clear what society could do at the front end from your, um, from your remarks as far as education and things of that nature. There's a lot of judges in this room tomorrow are going to have some 18 and a half year old come in front of them charged with delivering cocaine. Uh, some kid that's a runner that's pleading guilty to trafficking cocaine. Do you have any words that Well, if it's tomorrow, they'll look at a court of appeal decision that 18 months is a starting point. In the long run, in the long run, I think you're going to look at that is where I'm really talking about. What is the background in relation to that person? Why does he get himself into that situation? There seems to be a lack of that type of discussion. That's part of what you need to do in terms of bringing it forth to any judge to make sure what reasonable alternatives. It's one thing to say that we have that as a starting point, but I think it's always your job to say, yes, I understand the starting point, but let me present to you this plan that says that maybe we should try something else. Consistency is the last resort of the unimaginative, but <clears throat> to make that sale to somebody is to really question stare decisis. That's what you're really doing. Never forget the man on the dock. Who is this individual? And that's why sentencing cannot be a uniform automatic placement because you do this type of crime. Who is this that's in front of you? That becomes your job, to elucidate what that information is. Because that, I have ex high expectations of people. And that's part of what I would look at. Here's the law, here's how we can deviate from it, here's why we need to. Does that make sense in terms of how you might look at it? But tomorrow, there'll be that Court of Appeal decision. It says 18 months. Mr. Justice Popescule has often said that the Supreme Court has made it a mistake 
quite often, but I don't know where he gets that from. But, <laughs> but, <laughs> as with any case, again, you're dealing with stare decisis. Even the Supreme Court of Canada has made changes and has reversed themselves or has morphed into different decisions. If you feel that there is something I mean, it's incumbent upon you to raise it with both counsel and see if they would address that as to whether or not we need to follow this particular avenue of action. It's not simple to simply say, Supreme Court of Canada has said this. Take a good look, and I keep saying, never forget the man on the dock. That becomes your responsibility as to how you can push that decision aside and maybe look at another avenue of dealing with an individual. Because again, sentencing to be individualized is to look at this individual circumstances. That's where your opening is. Yes, it's difficult, but it's not impossible. What is bad law one day or uh, a decision of dissent makes good law in the future. So don't give up on that basis. Yes. Last question. Thank you so much for coming to the You mentioned uh, some of the what some call upstream factors uh, that contribute to criminalization uh, and incarceration, um, notably poverty uh, and, and lack of education. So I wonder if you could um, mention any of the intersections that you see between the justice system and the criminal justice system, some of the Students always have difficult questions. <clears throat> when I look at taking a good hard look of what the underlying factors are, again, I'm trying to change the, a bit of the outlook that we are simply always looking at making the, the, say the, if the principle of the law that we're looking at in order to put a person in jail is safety of the community, then we keep looking at that, but we don't ever change anything to this individual. We need some communication of other parties that look at how can they provide some service to this individual? Where, who intervenes? Maybe probation does, and that's what you start looking at. You start looking at the whole system. Who can best be equipped to do that type of investigation or uh, looking into something with respect to this individual? It's not an easy situation. And I know that Court of Appeal and other jurisdictions say that you have to move things along. Otherwise, this whole system of... Uh, of uh, delay comes into play. But you have to keep pushing back to a certain extent. Law is not meant to be simply uh, something that we follow. We can question it. But you have to have a reason basis to do that. It's not willy-nilly. <laughs> you have to have a plan. And if you push that plan in a discussion, what is wrong with that? And you, you do have to push other people. You're not alone there. You're merely the person that makes that decision to that extent. So again, thank you very much. I'll just say, Judge Moran, we'd like to thank you for being with us today, for delivering not only a fascinating, but a very important lecture to show our appreciation and remind us you of us, we'd like to present you with a small gift, which is a plaque for your office.